Welcome to Uptown Rumble, Heavy Music in the Bronx. My name is Stephen Payne, Director of the Bronx County Historical Society. Today is March 12th, 2024, and here for an oral history, uh, Mike, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself real quick. Sure. So my name is Mike Scarantino, also known as Mikey Disgrace. Uh, Mikey has won. Um, I was the singer in um, four bands. So I sang for Grave Disorder, uh, State of Disgrace, All is One, Kill the Clock, and I forget the other one. So that's four. I think there was a fifth, but it, four. Because I started a straight edge band uh, toward the tail end of uh, me quitting uh, being in bands. Great. And we're also here with Muttley from Billy Club Sandwich. Hi there. Who uh, might might come on camera, might ask some questions too, uh, might just uh, you know give Mike a hard time. Um, I mean, we'll, I we'll usually, see. usually do that. Anyway. Yeah, he's good at it. <laughs> so, so, Mike, why don't you start off by talking a little bit about your family history and background. Sure. And whatever you know about how your family ended up in the Bronx. Sure. So, my, um, I'm uh, part Puerto Rican, part Italian. My dad's Italian. My mom's Puerto Rican. Uh, she's from Ponce, Puerto Rico. My dad was born in America, but uh, family is from Sicily. Uh, they met in Harlem. Uh, they dated from high school, and then um, my dad actually owned a disco boutique in Harlem uh, for a little while. And then when disco died, uh, he w didn't have a job, and uh, he was unemployed and sold, um, like, those little tchotchkes and little uh, trinkets that you see, glass uh, figurines and things at, um, what were they called, um, like fairs and and um, places to make money and then he ended up working in if people remember in the Bronx on Williamsbridge Road there was the hot dog paper company so the people who used to make the plastic not the plastic the little uh, paper casing. thing that the casing that you put the hot dog in yes there was one on the side right underneath the two train near Columbus uh. High School so my dad worked uh, there for a pretty long time. Um, so we're, I'm born and raised in the Parkchester section of the Bronx. Um, that's where we're from. Um, you know, so I grew up in the 70s when, uh, in the Bronx, when things were a little uh, hectic. Um, went to Columbus High School in the mid-late 80s. Uh, found myself listening to, I actually was introduced to rock music or heavy music from my uncle Mijo okay. on, my dad, on my mom's side. So he would come over on like the weekends and he'd bring his records and uh, we had a record player in the bedroom. Um, and at that time, I think I was listening to mostly like just radio rock, whatever was on the radio. Um, and he would bring Kiss, Led Zeppelin, Beatles, you know, um, and sort of introduce us to like, say the heavier side of, of music. Um, How and old were you around that time? Did I'm going to say like nine, ten years old. Okay. Um, so you're already listening to things on your own around then or just, yeah? Yeah, pretty much. So like, but mostly from him. So like I if see. he didn't bring the records to the house, we listened to mostly what was on the radio. My dad, uh, is actually an acapella singer, like not by profession, but he used to, he loves doing that stuff. So he would always be around the house singing, um, like Marvin Gaye, Frank Sinatra, a lot of blues and, and then jazz and that kind of stuff. Um, so we listened to that mostly in the house. But, um, what about your mom? Uh, she listened to whatever my dad listened to. Okay. She liked Latin music, but I like didn't love it, so it wasn't like something that was on unless like we had parties. Like, we used to have a lot of like holiday parties where her family would be over, you know, my dad's side, not so much, but my mom's side, you know, you know, Hispanics, we like to party. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, we'd have big holiday parties and they'd be over and you'd hear lots of ty different types of music, Latin music, R&B, dance music. Um, and then I remember, so in middle school was sort of where it was like, okay, now I'm starting to find like different music and it may not have been like, you know, it's like the metal that people don't call metal, but it was Iron Maiden. Uh -huh. It was uh, Scorpions. You know, I had like this little crew of, um, like we were all in the advanced classes in eighth grade. What so we, school was it? Uh, junior high school on 27. Okay, okay, okay. Um, on Castle Hill. So we had this like little table of eighth graders. Um, you know, we had our mullets and we wore our, like Scorpion <laughs> shirts and Motley Crue shirts. Um, 
Um, and then that was like sort of like where it was like, okay, I'm, I like a little bit more music on the fringier side of what's on the radio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, How big of a, of a group was that at at that table, oh man, yeah. I would say like 12 guys, maybe okay. 10, 12 guys. Um, and funny, because I have a twin brother who, um, he was kind of into it, but much more like of a hip hop guy. Yeah. But um, during the hardcore phase of uh, things, when we started listening to hardcore punk, um, he'd go to shows with us all the time, he was into it. And then the as soon as New York hardcore started merging with uh, hip hop, he started to just like, move much more toward like the hip hop side of things. Yeah. Um, and stop going to shows where I was like still going, you know, close to, I'll call it, you know, the phase everyone loves to call the violent New York hardcore phase that like eight, late eighties, early nineties, uh-huh. you know, where things just started getting a little bit heavier music wise. But with that came, uh, I think people liking the more extreme, like mosh pits and, and, and things like that. And that's when I started to say, you know, I think it's time I, kind of check out for a little while yeah um i was still i was in school as well um down at, i was at Baru college um so i was listening like at that phase i started listening to more like alice in chains pearl jam like it was still kind of like heavier music without sure. me having to you know go to cbgb's or go to wetlands or go to like uh places to see hardcore shows um but during that middle school uh phase um you know, we all went separate ways, high school wise. Some guys went to Lehman. Uh, I ended up at Columbus High School, and I can recall the first time uh, someone asked me to listen to Slayer, and then that was like that was the end of like the world as we know it. What what album or song did you listen to? Uh, it was I think it was Hallowates. So because okay. it had to be because that yeah. was the time that it. So I remember he had like a recorded copy of it. That he was passing around. Uh, the guy's name was Danny, actually. Um, and he was like, hey, man, like, you know, I see you in your, like, Motley Crue shirt and your, like, Iron Maiden shirt. And he was like, dude, this other stuff you got to listen to. Check this out. Um, and that was it. Then I, then that's when, you know, I started going downtown to go to record stores, Bleaker Bob's, uh, Tower Records, right? You could find all that stuff there. So um, that was the treasure trove, right? So then you start to find Overkill, Slayer, Megadeth. You know, Metallica then started to creep in there. So I started to get into the more, like, thrashy side of, and death metal side of music. Um, was your twin on He the liked Slayer. He lo- I would tell you, he loved Slayer. Slayer was like, when Rain and Blood came out, I think we played that on our boombox. Because we would carry the, mo- the boombox to school. And then <laughs> nice. get it, and then get it confiscated, or at least held until, and we would walk. Because we, we, we didn't live close to Castle Hill. In Parchus, but we were close enough that we could walk to school. Yeah. Um, and we would walk, and we were blasting rain and blood, you know, like going to, to school. Uh, and actually, no, that was Columbus. We'd walk down walk Tremont, the and then we'd turn Williams Bridge Road, and listening to, to the boombox, actually. That wasn't even, that was in middle school. We would go, because I lived in Parchus, so we would walk all the way down East Tremont to the Williams Bridge Road McDonald's. Then make a left turn and uh-huh. walk all the way to Columbus. And when I tell you, we played that Rain and Blood tape like over and over and over. But that was like also like where we then knew, okay, there was like other kinds of like music. Because you knew it had that thrashy metal. Yeah. It also had a little bit of hardcore in it. Yeah. Um, and so um, same guy, Danny, we're in the hallway because he was my friend um, in school. He has, um, and I have the original cassette still in my house. He hands me the original Agnostic Front, Victim in Pain. Rat, it says it, Rat Cage Records, 1983, 84. It's the cassette of it. I have it in my house. So probably the only thing I still own uh, from hardcore. Um, he said, dude, listen to this. It's going to change your life. And from that point on, I, I mean, I still listen to, you know, Slayer and Metallica and Megadeth and all that stuff now. But I think at that point, phase of my life that was it i was a hardcore kid i wanted to know where i could find this band this type of music where was it who did it um and then um he was like dude we all take the train we go to cbgb's there's something called sunday matinee you gotta come yeah and i was like on sundays and it was funny because i was working in the mcdonald's on williams bridge uh-huh. road when i was in high school so they would come they were the pelham parkway guys 
they would come down on the eight bus and like meet me after work or meet us all after work and we'd all hang out. Uh, they'd drink beers in the parking lot and get drunk and um, I'd have to uh, put them on the bus. Um, <laughs> so um, um, they were like, all right, let's start taking the train down. But they live Pelham Park where I live Park Justin. So for me, the six train got me to shows. For them, the five train got them to shows. So um, I had a buddy across the street named Ian. So me, Ian, and my brother Dave would take the train. We'd meet my buddy Hoogan at the train station, and we would take the six train down to Seabees. I mean, when I tell you, I don't think I missed a Sunday matinee when I was in high school. Like, not one. I was at every show that when the flyers are online and you find them, I'm like, I was there, 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 I was there. there." Like, I was into the New York hardcore scene. I mean, I was straight edge too, so when the straight edge band started to pop, it made it even just more alluring to, like, be able to, like, know that these were, like, the music and the people you wanted to be around. Um, Before you went to CV's, had you been to other shows in New York? uh, Yeah, so, like, it's funny. So, like, I was talking to Muttley. You know, back then, 18, you can get into a bar. So, like, at 16, 17, I had a full beard. Full beard. So, like, I looked like an, an adult. So, yeah. like, at 16, 17, they were letting us into the bars where the metal bands would play. Yeah. So, like, I've seen Hellhound, The Unjust. Like, I've seen those bands play. Um, I even saw Unjust when they were a punk band before. They were that thrashy hammerhead band. Uh-huh. Um, I just can't recall all the names of the places okay. because that phase was so short in my my musical journey that it was like, well, there's nothing really here in the Bronx sure. for me to check out. You know, CBGB's is where, and, you know, New York City, Lower East Side's where it's all at. Um, so that's where, like, I ended up, we'll say, the teenage years. And then, like I said, 90s, Killing Time. Sure. And I love the band, but they were also just lumped into that genre of, like, when the h- hardcore got too hardcore for people. Right. Um, and then I was like, hey, like, I got to check out of this. Like, this just isn't, like, it's not the thing I signed up for when I was yeah. into it. Um, and then... Um, I met my wife. I was working in the Department of Education, and um, but as a kid, I was going to Dwayne to some records all the time. Like I have the breakdown demos, side by side demos. Like I have those, had those cassette demos like in my house. You know, like I was a hardcore kid. You did know, you, did you go to other concerts like yeah. regular arena shows? Yeah, and so then start going to clubs. Yeah, and so I saw right? Iron Maiden during the Peace of Mind tour, Number uh-huh. Beast tour. Okay. Scorpions. Is that Radio City? Uh, yeah. yeah. Radio City. I've seen them in Madison Square Garden too. I uh, saw so the Scorpions with Bon Jovi. I saw Motley Crue. Oh my God. I, as much as people want to hate on them, seeing Tommy <laughs> Lee play the drums live is like nothing you can... Like the guy is amazing. Like And so like I was doing that stuff, but um, I was too young to go by myself. So my neighbor who was older would take us his name was Anthony yeah. and like we, my mom was best friends with them and my dad would be, so he would take us to those concerts and then as I started working on my own at McDonald's um, my parents were like well you work in the closing shifts you can take a train and go wherever you want by yourself making your own money and you're in school you you know go do what you want and then I would go to the concerts uh, by myself but that's a great question yeah a lot of arena shows so Metallica um in the Meadowlands, I think. Uh-huh. One of my favorite shows, Wu-Tang Clan and Rage Against the Machine. That was after I got out of hardcore, right? Yeah, so sure, that was sure, like sure. the stuff I was listening to when I stopped listening to hardcore. And I'll tell the interesting story about how I got back into hardcore and he's going to laugh at it. But, um, um, so that was like the heaviest stuff I was listening to, but I knew Zach was in Inside Out and that was yeah, one sure. of my favorite bands in the world. So like that was an easy connection. Right. Um, and then like 90 to 90, I would say 90 to like 93, 94, I was just done. Like I wasn't going to shows. I wasn't listening to hardcore. I couldn't tell you who was playing in bands. And then um, I went, I was working at Madison Square Garden. I was w- working Smashing Pumpkins show. And um, some guy was wearing a Fahrenheit 451 shirt at that sh- at that show and i was selling t-shirts i remember selling smashing pumpkin t-shirts and i'm like hey like is that a band or something like that's a cool shirt 
And the guy was like, yeah, they're this band from the Bronx. You should check. You should just check them out or whatever. And I'm like, all right, well, where am I going to find it? So yeah. um, I was dating my wife. I think we were just we had just got married. This was before YouTube time. Yeah. So time. Um, we, we should talk about MySpace, too, because that's an interesting. <laughs> I wasn't on it, but I know good good things about how like my bands found people. Um, so um, me and my wife used to love go to the village and just eat you know, dinner, hang out, walk, walk around. And she would always say, Hey, you like music. You want to stop in the record stores? So I was like, yeah, sure. Let's go to Bleaker Bob's. Looks like my favorite spot in the world. So we walk in and then like, you know, they have the demo case in the front. So I walk in, there's the Fahrenheit 451 demo, uh, the two song demo. And then 25 to life's demo is there. (laughs) So I don't know, you know, so I'm like, all right, like, I say to the guy, is this hardcore, like New York hardcore? Or like, what would you categorize it? He was like, yeah, these are like all the New York hardcore bands, uh, their demos. So like I picked up a couple and then that was it. I was like, one, this Fahrenheit stuff isn't really like super hardcore, but it has that like, it had that, like that post melodic stuff that I was like, I like this. Like, I don't have to just like be killer mosh into it. And then it was like, and 25 to Life was just like what I remembered. It sounded like they were copying Agnostic Front to some yeah, degree, you know? So I was like, dude, hardcore's still here. It didn't go away, and there's some positivity to it. Uh, you know, let me check it out. So I go to buy wedding dresses in Queens, New York. My wife's shopping with her friend, and Castle Heights is right across the street from this wedding spot. <laughs> and um, there's a bunch of hardcore kids outside of it. And I'm like, Oh man, like this hardcore out here? It's like in, Queen, in it's still in Queens, New York. Right I'm like, place, I, right time. I'm like, I wonder who the hell's playing. So I go across. Sure enough, it's EGH, Billy Club Sandwich, <laughs> and I can't remember the other band. And I'm like, all right, I'm gonna check this out. I'm gonna like chill. I'm gonna and like, <laughs> like I remember saying to myself. At one point, and it's funny because I love both bands, but at that point it was like they were sort of the side of like hardcore. I was like, that's why I kind of left the thing in the first place. <laughs> but there was like this, you could see that it was there, that magic that's like, and it wasn't so negative as much as the bands were heavy. You know, everybody was chilling, it was vibing, it was so, and the diversity was there of the people. And, and I was like, but the music's good. Like, I can't deny that I like it. So I'm like, this is cool. Um, so I go back home and I say to my wife I'm going to start a band and she's like band like what the hell are you going to do in a band <laughs> and I'm like you know I've always wanted to be in a band so when I was in high school um the guy Danny started a band and I'm sure people can't find them a band called Schizoid they were like a hardcore thrash band that would play the battle of the bands my friends were in it so we would go see them play Lehman and Columbus and they played CBs once so Columbus had battle yeah, they had them too uh, before I would say Mutley's time. Um, you know, I, not like, I did go to one at Columbus. Yeah, yeah, and that and so Schizoid probably played it at, toward the tail end of their lives. Um, but there was a record, there was a rehearsal studio down the block, not the one closer to the hospital, but there was one like if you turned left on Williamsbridge Road, there was a rehearsal studio uh, where all the Bronx bands would rehearse and. Um, we said, well, let's start a band and let's put our initials in it. So it was my, it was, so my name's Mike, my friend was Ian, and my brother was David. So we started a band called Massive Interglobal Destruction. Huh. <laughs> I played drums and didn't know how to play drums. So that was just bad business. <laughs> so we would rent the room, and my friend Ian would try to play guitar. My brother would sing. I'd play drums. And we had this Indian kid that was listening to metal at school. I forget his name. Uh, on bass. Um, You're talking and it, about the place by Pathmark? You got it. No, it's actually the place now that where the Montefiore Hospital buildings all are. You know those Montefiore little buildings are? So there used not, to be a recording studio to the left. Not the one by... The one by Pathmark's after. Unlimited. Yeah, Music I Unlimited it comes uh, later. East Coast okay. Studios. It is maybe. East Coast Studios, possibly. Yeah. yeah. So so we were t- we were terrible. It was bad. And that was my like first stint at trying so to be in, in a band. Bit, that was in high school. Uh, and I was like, ah, you got to be talented to be in a band. Yeah. To some degree, you got to play an instrument. Um, Did you have a, a drum kit or anything at home? Hell no, man. Just we just like, with, right? I think one day just we were just, around. one day we all just met at the McDonald's and we said, all right, that's the name of the band. I remember we even did the initials of the, like we did a logo. My brother was a great graffiti artist, still is. And he would do the logo. It had the M. With the X and the I and the X and the D, like DRI, like it was like yep. a DRI logo. Yeah, yeah. And we were like, dude, we're gonna like 
blow it up. Like we're gonna be awesome. And I think it was like four rehearsals in, we realized we you actually have to know how to actually have some talent. <laughs> um, and so then I think that was like my uh, that was like my entry to like saying I want to be in a band. Okay, okay. So um, so like I'm looking to be in a band. I'm like, how do you like I'm twenty? I think I was twenty seven, twenty eight years old. Like, how do you find a band at twenty eight? Like, what do you do? Like, how do you find one? Um, so my daughter was born and, um, I went to get a tattoo. So, um, I go, uh, to the place on Tremont. I forget the heck of the name of the place. Scene? Scene, no, the one before Scene. Oh. Right near Lehman. That first one. Right there. I forgot the name of it. Me too. I know what you're But, um, so, um, I walk in, simple lettered, Serena, that's my daughter's name, tattoo, and I meet a Brazilian guy, um, and he's like, oh, well, what kind of music do you listen to? And I'm like, oh, I like hardcore, you know, metal. He's like, oh, you listen to hardcore? So he starts playing the Misfits on the radio while he's tattooing me, and we just get to talking. He says he's a guitar player. His buddy plays the drums. Uh, did I want to start a band? Um, and I was like, well, I don't have a talent, so I don't know what I'm going to do. And he said, well, you could sing. Like, you know, you're like the American. You could be the singer because the drummer was from Brazil. He was from Brazil. I was like, all right, cool. I know a bass player. Because I knew um, a guy named Marty, who he actually played in some early uh, metal and rock bands in New York, too. I just can't. Uh, he actually made the movie uh, Crackoon, if you ever look at it. There's a the Bronx made movie. He yeah. ma made that film. So he lived across the street from me. He was a bass player, metalhead, long hair. I'm like, hey, dude, do you want to play punk hardcore? And he was like, what? And I was like, we need a bass player. And, you know, it'll fill your week night up. You come, we jam for two hours play a couple of covers, I'll write a couple of original songs with the guys, we'll, we'll figure it out. And that's how Grave Disorder was born. Uh, um, okay, okay. So we practiced in, we practiced in Music Unlimited, I believe, because there was no way we drove anywhere else. Um, and uh, we wrote like four original songs and we played a Blood for Blood cover. Um... And so we said, hey, well, let's start playing some shows. Let's get out there. And um, I think, I remember I was designing a website. I remember, my wife will probably remember this too. I was designing a website on our, our computer, learning code and trying to figure out how to do a website. And um, something called the Bronx Underground kind of popped up. And I was like, oh, what the hell is the Bronx Underground? You know, oh, you know, it's like a chat room or something for people to find other bands. Um and I remember we posted the demo up there to say, hey, like, take a check it out. Here's the demo. You you know, you can download it or find it or whatever from the website. Yeah. Um, and then um, we put the guy's name was Marcio. We put Marcio's contact information to book the band or contact the band. And we got contacted to play a um, couple of bars, uh, the one, what's that one? It's closer to where I used to live on Hobart. It, it's now a, um, LBG, it was now like an LBGTQ bar. The place under like the train? You're under, about? no, like off of, um, Middletown Road, almost. Like, it's that bar right on the corner, O'Malley's or something it was called, or whatever. So we were asked to yeah, play, um... Not Jimmy Ryan's. No, we were asked to play a, a show there, and that was our first show. Um, I can't recall who we played with. Um, what, what, around what year would that have been? That was, um, so I'm going to go with, I'm going to say 99. Okay. Two, 2001. Around, nine, 2000, probably. Maybe, maybe 2000, 2000. Closer to 2000. Because 97, my, 97, my daughter's born. Uh -huh. I got the tattoo in 98. 798 so um it had to be that around that time maybe close to 2000 so by the time we wrote the songs yeah because it was a very slow moving kind of thing it wasn't like we were jumping on it i was a a special ed teacher in the bronx my wife was a teacher uh you know my daughter was small so it was just like dabbling yeah. um and stuff but i was still going to shows um and seeing bands like i saw dropkick murphy's at wetlands agnostic front of wetlands Fury of Five at Wetlands, like I would be going to shows, like starting to pick that up a little bit in my life, um, and my wife, who I love and I thank so much, uh, was like, yeah, whatever, that's your thing, you like it, I'm not into it, you know, have fun, um, 
sort of 25 to life there. I bought a bunch of fake merch from Rick to life um, <laughs> during that time. Um, sort of Fahrenheit there. I think I've seen Billy Club there too. But um, so like I was getting into the scene, but I wasn't like a super social kind of guy. Like um, in the sense like I would get to know people. I kind of like, I was actually even going to shows by myself then. Uh, I didn't really have anybody going with me at the time until my buddy Hoogan every once in a while, but he also just started like getting out of just going to shows. Um, and then, um, where was I going with that? Um, so then Grave Disorder plays that one show. I guess people liked us. We weren't very talented, honestly, as a band. It was, it wasn't very well put together. Um, but I think people just were like, okay, it's hardcore, it's punky, it's in the Bronx, you know, on a hundred Bronx bands playing at the time. Um, so um, this bar or this place, right? This is that other club now, the one we played at. Um, oh, Parkway. Yeah, what was that called? Sixteen eighty, right? Oh, so it was like a restaurant. It was a restaurant first, right, right next to the stables. And next to the stables. Uh -huh. Um, Park they Park were still work. yeah, they were booking shows and letting people book shows. And Bobby, I think from OHR was booking shows. So I knew Bobby because we both were like special education uh, teachers um, in schools. And Bobby lived a couple of blocks away from where I lived on Hobart. So we would see each other a lot, but we also knew each other from the high school days. Um, so he was like, hey, man, like, oh, you, I heard you got a band. You guys want to start playing some shows. You know, we can get you on, on a couple of things um, here and there. We didn't play anything but bars and stuff. And for me, it was like, ah, well, I'm not in a band that just play like the local bar. But we got this 1680 gig. Um, Were from you the only straight edge guy in the band? Uh, in all my bands, actually. Okay, no, your yeah, bands, okay. yeah. So then, um, so I think Bobby had my number. He was like, hey, can you get the band together to play the 1680 place? Right. I got Billy Club Sandwich playing. And for me at that point, I knew who they were. I knew that I liked the band. I listened to them. So I was like, oh man, we're going to play with Billy Club. Like this is, this is dope. Um, um, and I think two for five played it as well. So, um, and they're like two, a punk two four five, mm -hmm. and also Bobby's other band providing the sickness play. That was it, PTS, right? Yes. Um, so I believe two four five opened. We played after them, and then whatever bands played after. But um, so we're like chilling or whatever. Like I'm, like I said, I wasn't like a super social kind of guy. But the guy from two four five is standing on the side, and he's like not drinking, and he's just hug hugging the wall. So I go up to him, I'm like, hey, your band's pretty good. We start chatting. Uh, sure enough, my my guitar player, Marcio, is getting hammered. Um, and in that getting hammered, um, I start to learn and realize that he's, like, not the nicest guy in the world. Um, so he starts, like, for some reason, I guess, heckling Billy Club. He's Brazilian, so he's Latin, right? Uh, starts heckling Billy Club, like, in a real super negative way. Yeah. Um, and the, then... The um, Ernie, right, but um, was our boy who was mm -hmm. in the pit while we were right, playing. he was a big guy, right? Big, yeah, yeah, big, big black, black dude. Black dude. Yep, yep, mad cool. He was vibing, doing yeah. his thing, um, and I think he was heckling him, bothering him. But he also had a couple of his buddies there that I didn't realize he had friends there with him. Um, um, and then things got a little bit out of sorts, and that was when I was like, I don't want to be in a band with anybody who hates people uh -huh. or like just isn't cool, like. Like, hardcore is about unity and playing shows together. Um, so we kicked him out of the band. So he got kicked out of the band, and the guy from 245 joined the band. And so one of the funniest things we did was there was a club called Mannheim Club. Um, the Beach Club. The Beach Club. Yes. Uh -huh. And they refused uh -huh. to put Grave Disorder on the show because of what happened. So, you know, Brian is his name, Brian Darwas. He, um, well, just to finish that story, by the mm -hmm. way, they tried to jump. Ernie, yeah, I left at that Billy point, Club's so I don't know this part. On, yeah. on our video, but they tried to jump Ernie, and that did not go well. No, no, from what I heard. <laughs> but, um, but this is, it's crazy because this is the other side yeah. of the same story. Story, yeah. Uh -huh. right. from, from your perspective and the whole thing of like that dude was kind of a jerk anyway. Yeah. And Yeah, I remember. I My wife owned a magenta-colored Honda Civic, so she drove to watch us play. And then um, she drove me back home, which was only a couple of blocks. 
But if I would have stood at the show, probably would have got beat up. Yeah. You know, which isn't cool by guilty by association. So it was like a, I could see that he was starting to get really like I think ignorant. we originally thought that it was two, four, five, and then we found out about what he grave disorder, but it was only one one guy, guy from uh, grave disorder. Uh, Correct. Um, and I never knew until we talked about it recently that you would kick him out because of that. Right. So he got he got exited, and the um, Brian Darwash joins the band. So Mannheim refused to book Grave Disorder, so he came up with this cool idea because Two Five Five was headlining that Grave Disorder was going to take over the show. So um, so I, I and I was cool with it because I was like, oh, what are we going to do? He's like, so during Two Four Five set, you're going to come up. I like we staged it. I was going to come up to the mic grab the mic from the singer and say something like, you know, you can't ban grave disorder. Like we're like, <laughs> well, I don't know, something stupid, you know, like really bad. Um, was and that, a Bronx, that was a Bronx Underground. It was a Bronx show. Underground show. And then um, we played the Blood for Blood cover. We played a Misfits cover and we did like one of the original songs that like people kind of knew like that had ever seen us. Um, and so my buddy Hoogan and a couple of, he brought a couple of guys just to make sure we had people like moshing, but the two, four, five crew kind of liked us because Brian was playing in two, four, five and he was right? playing in Grave yeah, Disorder. So, right. he was doing both. Um, so that made the friendship between Grave Disorder and two, four, five where, um, uh, we actually had the, we were supposed to play a show in Pennsylvania with blood for blood. So like we're driving up and uh two, four, five gets into an accident cause they're all drinking. They were a bunch of young guys who loved to drink. Um, they were drinking on the drive up and they totaled their car and we had to go back. So we never, we never made it to the show, but it'll be interesting because of connections between some of these guys and like popular hardcore bands later on. Um, I don't, didn't help them get in those bands, but just funny how the world works. Um, everything's connected. Yeah. Uh, so then Grave Disorder was, was pretty much on its way out. Brian was like, I don't really want to play in these songs or playing the band or be a cover could be doing a lot more covers. Um, and I was like, well, I love this thing. It's like a lot of fun being the front man of a band. Like I was enjoying it. Um, and, um, Craigslist was around at the time. So I'm sure the Craigslist killer as well, but, um, <laughs> um, like I was leery of it, but I was like, all right, how do I find people in bands besides shows? I knew, people but not like that so i remember i posted an ad on craigslist just said vocalist grave disorder here's the link um and richie vadalaro uh from queens new york sends me an email with two songs attached and says hey i think your vocals are cool i think you could match up on these songs let's try to start a band so we write the two songs we write, Leave Me Be, and we write, um, Leave Me Be, and No Use in Crying. So those two songs, which you can find, which you can find on Apple, iTunes, <laughs> not joking, uh, <laughs> everywhere. Um, uh, those are the two songs. But now we're we only have a guitar player and a vocalist, um, and he's like, dude, we got to find more people. So then I was like, well, oh, there's this Bronx Underground, like chat board or something board. maybe we put an ad out and see if we find a drummer and then we'll we'll go from there um but in the interim a buddy of mine who played drums for born was also a bronx guy friends with hoogan said hey you know let's drop let me drum on these songs with you i'll practice maybe i'll stay in the band we'll see what's going on he was still kind of doing born but he also had a lot of work uh for work and we would go to the studio in Yonkers to rehearse. So it was me. I always forget his name, but I think it's Day, It's Mike, too. So it was me, him, and Richie just playing the two songs. And he says, I got a name for the band. And I'm like, well, well what is it? He goes, you ever see that movie with Sean Penn called State of Disgrace? And I'm like, movie with Sean Penn? What the hell are you talking about? Is it a movie with Sean Penn called State of Disgrace? Let me check it out. And I think that was the actor. So um, check out the movie. It's got a pretty cool like vibe to it, theme to it. Feels like a hardcore band name. I was like, yeah, S O D. Who doesn't want to have the initials S O D? Like, 
you know, it's a genius. We, like we could even do fake merch, like you know, like a uh, copy merch. Uh, and the singer doesn't look like Scott Ian. And the singer doesn't look anything like Scott Ian. Which, by the way, in the gym this week, a guy comes up to me, asked me if I was him. So, um, so we're um, so now, so now we need a bass player. Um, and my buddy Heck, who was in State of uh, Grave Disorder, said, because he replaced uh, Marty, the long-haired guy. He said, you know, I'll do it for a little while. So like, now we're jamming on the two songs, jamming on the two songs. Uh, the bass player quits. The drummer quits. It's just me and Richie. Uh -huh. And um, some allegedly 18, 17-year-old kid named Danny posts, hey, here's my phone number, uh, email. I play drums in Dead on a uh, Dead Society, Dead Something, Dead Arrival, whatever the hell is Dead Band with Dead on a Friday. Uh, dead on a Friday. Um, I'm 17. I play the drums really well. We listen to the band online. We're like, holy crap, this kid's pretty good. Um, let's get him to meet us at the studio. Uh, little do we end up finding out he's 14. Uh, <laughs> he's not 17. Um, I have to babysit him. Um, but he's like, I mean, he's like. Uh, at that time, becomes like, a, like a nephew to me. We'll say. But he was a real good drummer. Good, excellent drummer, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, still drums for like an emo pop punk yeah. kind of thing, kind of cool. Um, I got to ask a question. Mm -hmm. How long was it before you and Richie found out that you were both teachers? We knew right away. You knew right away. Yeah, that we knew because I think we were we were so we talked so much to try to get the thing because he was. He was even trying to get his friends from a band he was in called Jets Jaguar to try to play, but I think because they were lived they lived on Long Island, and he lived in Queens at the time. For me and him, he drove, so he actually kudos to Richie. He would drive to Yonkers for the rehearsals, but he'd pick me up because I didn't drive and I didn't know how to get to Yonkers by myself. And we would like we would practice with three guys, you know, and try to get a try to get a band going. But we didn't know. The better question was. When did we find out Danny was only 14 years old and <laughs> we were letting him drink at the shows oh, wow. because we were playing bars and he was telling us he was 17, 18 and we were saying to ourselves, and well, you know, sure, he should be, it should be 21, but that's his business. If they want to serve him, they serve him. The kid was getting wow. alcohol from And from, by the way, us. just to show you that everything is connected, Jets Jaguar, Richie's old band, singer, Mm -hmm. Was Anthony from my band? Ben, right, uh -huh. which I have, I still have that distance demo totally in my house. Totally random connections. All weird, right? So then, um, so we got the drummer, and then I forget how we got Jimmy, the second guitar player, but I believe Richie was already on MySpace at the time, recruiting people. I was going to ask you where MySpace fits. Yeah, so and he was he would ran the MySpace, so he was he even I mean he was pretty bold, so. He would put up the scratch demo stuff. It was just a drummer, a guitar player, and me, just to see if we could get people to play. And I think Jimmy, since he was in Queens, connected with Richie. And then we had two guitar players, but we still had no bass player. And this is where Phi from Caught in a Trap comes in. So he replies to an ad on MySpace from Richie, shows up, and State of Disgrace is, is born. And I'm going to say that's 2004. 2005. Okay, okay, okay. Um, and then we start playing, you know, we start recording, putting together, playing some good shows. We played CBs. Uh, we replaced 100 Demons on the uh, couple of CB shows uh, when it was about to close. Uh, we played a couple of those just because um, they were letting bands play. Um, and then we, little did I know, Richie was friends with... Um, with uh, Cousin Joe from Black and Blue Productions. So we we're getting a couple of decent offerings because he was trying to be helpful and he kind of liked some of the songs of the band. Um, so we're playing out. We're doing you know, doing our thing. It's a great time. Um, and then we start to change lineups. So Fi decides he wants to sing for Caught in a Trap. Uh, we do rehearsals, uh, trials for a bass player. And I forget the kid's name, but we find this... Really talented. I mean, he's an amazing bass player, skinny guy. He played at that Halloween show. I forget his name. Um, and um, is he the one that recorded some of the stuff? Yeah, yeah. He's I can't he, he's a talented guy. Some of the stuff he did was was good, but it didn't fit the band toward the end. But um, which was problematic. Um, and Jimmy gets kicked out, which 
that story, I don't even know how that happens, but Richie kind of like was like, I can handle guitar duties on my own. Um, I think he felt like uh, Jimmy was just starting to maybe not take State of Disgrace as seriously as he wanted it to. Um, and then, oh, wait, no, we cra he crashed the van. Oh, so we oh. had, that's what happened. So there was a, I don't remember the Manhattan Club um, where you would have to carry all your stuff down the stairs. Downstairs? Down, I believe. It wasn't up. There was, so there was a club. We were playing a late night show. My wife actually went to the show. And we had the van for the very first time. Richie bought a van. Oh, was it Fontana's? Could have been. Because could have been because Joe definitely had a connection there. They had done some shows. Could have been. So could have been. That's the only place that I could think of was down. It was either way. It was in a, that era because there was there was Underworld long before that. Yeah. That so it was like early to mid nineties. So we had the van. We're playing. We're we're loading it up at my house. Um, Danny's drums at my house so that we could have like a big bar on the main floor. Can't and remember. Also, yeah, it yeah. was probably fantastic. So we get there and I think the story goes that Jimmy forgot to put it in park while we started to unload. Like, so the car had stopped, but he, I think he had turned off the key, but for some reason I think the van was messed up, huh. but no one wanted to say that it was because he didn't, didn't put the parking brake on or something. And the, van starts to drive down the block and we're all chasing the equipment's falling out we're trying to grab it and pull it and it turns left and oh smashes into it like and it wasn't going fast but you know yeah, it's a car it, it smashes into a couple of cars on the side we didn't play the show uh we lost the van because it was the first day of it and we couldn't afford the insurance going up on it and i think you know what happens is you know and this happens in bands, you blame somebody. I think Richie was mad and upset, so I think we put the blame on Jimmy, and it really wasn't his fault. Um, so now Jimmy's out of the band, um, and we play as a four-piece for a while. We record um, the we record the full-length record that got put out in um, on um, I think in Spain uh, through some. Um, record label. They were doing like a lot of like posy, hardcore, straight edge, hardcore, but they liked us a lot. Um, which is funny because a guy from that company actually reached out to me in an email, don't know how he found me, to ask me if I was okay with them putting it out on vinyl. And I was like, sure, if anybody wants to buy it. This was recently? <laughs> like maybe five years ago. Oh, wow. Okay. So then I was like, all right, cool, dude. Like, and he was like, oh, you know, what do you want to do compensation wise? I was like, dude, I don't really like. We don't care. Like, I don't, it's cool if you put out the record. Um, and then Richie uh, decides he just wants to quit. Like, when I tell you quit, it was like we were at a practice for a show, and he turns around and just says, like, Mike, I'm done playing in, wow. like, I'm done playing in State of Disgrace, which then in turn made Danny say, well, if he's quitting, like, I don't think I want to play in the band anymore because yeah. he kind of wrote all the most of the music um and we were having trouble with keeping a bass player anyway at that time um but Muttley played in the band for a little while toward the tail end um you probably were in the room when he quit the day he quit because we had a rehearsal and then i remember i think it was like the day who quit bridge quit state of disgrace you were there well, no, when I filled in, Richie was still in the band. Right, but then he quits, and that's the end of the band. I don't remember. Yeah, so then... I so, remember playing, and, and Danny was out at that point. Right, but Jet's Jaguar drummer was playing, his buddy. Joe. Joe, right, right. So then that was falling apart there. That's what happened. Richie quits because Joe said he was done. Richie didn't want to keep looking for a drummer. Joe decided he was leaving. Richie said, you know what, I'm just not... Doing it anymore? I don't know if that happened in the room. I think that, that may have been a phone call or something. I Could remember have been. Joe decided he didn't want to do it anymore and everything just kind but of. But Richie quit. Oh no, this is the second time Richie quits. So that's right. So the second time Richie quits is the second phase of State of Disgrace when it's Johnny from Token Entry on bass. Um, who was the drummer? Um. Oh, my friend Ian, my buddy Ian, Straight Edge Ian, was on drums. Um, Eric or Ernie was his name. 
He played in a heavy band out in Long Island. He was buddies with Richie. He played second guitar, and Richie played. We started playing a couple of shows. We played with Wisdom and Chains in PA. We played like two or three Jersey shows, and it looked like we were getting like hot again, let's say, and we were going to start playing. That's when he quits. He We're in a room at a practice, and he says, Mike, I'm quitting the band. We play one more show without Richie, the 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 – the in Pennsylvania, the Ernie guy or Eric guy plays that show, okay. and that's the end. No more State of Disgrace was done, okay. but there was no original members left in that band. We played the Bronx Underground three times, or two times, two times, which those shows were amazing, and I was thankful to even get to play on them. But now I remember, like my connection to getting Muttley even in bands was the night of October twenty ninth. That show yes, and Halloween the show. Night that my kids were born. Hit a kid that his kids were born. Cousin Joe put us on a show with Sub Zero, Billy Club. Can't remember the opening band because we got to play second. I remember we I played think second. Agents of Man might have been on that show. Oh, they were awesome. Because this is the first guys, time I saw them live. Those guys were there. Their singer was amazing, but what, they were just an amazing bit. They actually opened and we played second because was, I was running late. Well, we also didn't know if we were going to play at all, Mike, because, because you I, were in labor. Mike, no, not you. You're, you're yeah, significant my, other at the time. My wife at the time gave birth at like seven something. And mm. I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I'm getting to the show. <laughs> and that was when I formally oh. first, I think, socialized with Muttley. Uh-huh. Because, one, well, we, they're celebrating we a birth. once or twice before. But not... You had emailed me at one point at, about if I wanted to play bass. And I don't remember if that was Grave Disorder or the beginning of State of Disgrace. It had to be the beginning of and State I of Disgrace. And I was busy with Billy Club, so yeah. I passed. Yeah, I would have never asked you to join Grave Disorder because that was on the way out. Right. But, um, but like, was... and I think that's when we became friendly. So right. then I think we started to realize, one, um, you know, that we both like wrestling, heavy music. We were from the Bronx. Um, and that I liked it, you know, I liked his band, mutual res- like respect for each other. Um, and then we started hanging out. Like you'd come to my house, watch well, pay per views and you stuff. Said your remember, bass player quit that yeah. night. That night we threw him out because oh, he wrote out, a right. ready because he wrote an email about me telling me I wanted to be like Freddie Madball or some nasty email. Like, I don't know where that <laughs> came from, but like said like a real scathing kind of email. Like I like I thought it was somebody I wasn't, and he and I'll tell you he can attest I'm like the most humble guy you could talk to when it comes to stuff. I just was having a good time That's with friends. Far. Um, so we were like, dude, what's he up and to? And to be fair, I, I didn't know the dude at all. I yeah. had him once. I, yeah. So, I, I so had we were just finishing the recording of the third demo, which was all the recordings that went on that record. So we were asked to then... Um, the label was United Against Society. That actually. was it. Uh, uh, look at him. Uh, 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 so we recorded a video with the same guy. He's super famous now. Custer. Kevin Custer. He was friends with Richie and said, hey, you guys want to do a music video for that Down Not Out song? It's really catchy. It's kind of awesome. You know, it's got a sing-along hook. I'll do a free video for you guys because I'm trying to become a videographer um, and do videos, which he does the Sub-Zero video, Hate Breed video, some rap videos. So it's like pretty cool connection. Yeah. Um, we're like, sure. So it's pouring rain. We're playing under the Brooklyn Bridge and we put out the Down Not Out video, which you can find on YouTube, by the way. Um... Um, and it's like, I think that started to help us sort of like be able to say, Hey, check out our band. Like, here's a video, check out the record, you know, the songs. And, um, you know, we were like on the cusp of doing something big because we were recording with Dom Fury and, um, we needed to re-record the baseline for cheesy song, but it was catchy when we played it. It was a song called Never Go Away. And it was about New York hardcore. So the chorus went, it'll never go away. New York, hardcore. So he came in, he was in the band at the time, and we went to Don Fury and, and re-recorded we well, the, the bass line for it because we were supposed to shoot a video we were shooting like a two video days later. And also with that song, he just kind of he kind of overplayed. Right. And, and I wasn't comfortable at all trying to play what he had played. So if we were going to do the video... Yeah, he was fiddling around on that yeah, thing. Like, he was, the diddles, well, diddles was, everywhere. Uh, it, you know, it Man. was more rancid style than... Uh, Correct. I see. Man, it was a great song. It was catchy as all hell. I don't know how I well, came up with I the lyrics. I redid the bass track because we were going to do the video. Mm-hmm. 
but then things fell apart. Right. That was that was fall apart one. That was when yeah, then I that didn't was even know about yeah that was fall of, two fall apart one. Uh huh. So so now state of disgrace is over. Um, Danny still kind of wants to play music. Um, the drummer, but he doesn't want to do state of disgrace. He hits me up and he says, "Oh, Jimmy wrote a bunch of songs. We've been trying to find people um, to jam on these on these songs." Um, you want to start singing in a band again? And I'm like, sure. Like, let's check it out. Let's, 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 um, let's, let's, let's see where it goes. And, um, Jimmy finds this guy named Chris who becomes the second guitar player. So at the time it was only two guitars, drums, and myself. And we, um, wrote the all is one demo and we played uh, burning fight. And then we found some kid. I don't even remember where we found him from, from Brooklyn or something. Uh, I think Danny found him. Um, he played bass. Nice kid, nice guy. I forget Tony. his name. Tony. He remembers everything. Tony. and Only the useless stuff. Right? Yeah. And we're like, we're like, I don't know. Like, I will tell you, it was like, as much as I love being in State of Disgrace, there was something about this all is one when we played and hung out. Like, you could tell, like, the music had something to it. You know, we were doing a little bit of the old school style hardcore, a little bit chuggy stuff, but they were allowing me to kind of be myself lyrically, which I will say in State of Disgrace toward the end, Richie was writing a lot of the lyrics and I had written most of the lyrics in the band. So I think it was like, well, I don't really know if I want to sing about some of the stuff that Richie was asking me to sing about, but all is one was let me write like, you know, like songs about straight edge and, um, uh, songs about unity and positivity and I was like this is like the vibe I've always kind of been on as a, a guy in a band you know but they could be themselves too and be goofy and silly and you know they acted up all the time he knows it was like babysitting um <laughs> but it was like we just had this thing and we played a couple show we played the Bronx Underground a couple times um we put together a birthday show for me which I didn't know was a birthday show um in the pyramid and it was like a ton of bands played. Right. Uh, Death, um, um, Hammer Bros, Death Before Dishonor, Mind Peace was supposed to play, but they didn't show up. Oh, right. um, Brace War, like all of a sudden we're starting to get connected with like bigger bands. Um, and a they were actually cool with playing with us. Um, and we were actually doing some out of state stuff. So um, we played Rhode Island, we played New Jersey, PA, like we did a couple of weekends, which. I'm going to thank my wife again because she was mad cool with the idea that I could go away and play in a band for two, three days and her not know what the hell was going on. Um, you know, and we were just getting attention. Mongoloids. I mean, we were playing with some pretty good bands. And I was like, wait a second. Like, we could probably do something like, not big. I think like, like within the New York hardcore spectrum of things, like we could pretty much start doing pretty good things. Um, and we're getting attention without like Richie knowing Cousin Joe or knowing people. Cousin Joe liked the band. Like yeah. he sang uh, New York Crew with me. Um, oh, yeah, I have the video footage that. of that too. Was that at the Pyramid? Uh, at the Pyramid. Yeah. That was my alleged birthday show. But like, you know, there were actual people who played in bands in the audience of the show I played. Like the um, Paul Barrow was there. Sib was there. Like you said to yourself, wait a second, these people are checking out my band, wow. like and coming like all the way down with cousin Joe. Sure, he was singing on the song, but like you were like playing for people that you looked up to and that you were impressed by, and they were actually in the audience while you played. Like you were saying to yourself, wait a minute, this thing actually could go somewhere, um, and that's where Muttley kind of like then starts to be the bass player because. Um, well, originally you guys were getting together writing stuff. Right, but we had who, but, who's that bass player that you knew? He played in a Bronx heavy band. Well, that was later. That was Scott, who used to be. No, Vic. In, no, Vic played bass first before Scott. I don't even remember Vic. Vic played before Scott, or was Vic like his nickname and it was Scott? Redheaded guy. You're thinking of Scott. Dang, There's see, no thank God for so Muttley, by the way. Was his nickname, yeah, I guess so. Scott. Not that I ever knew. Him. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, Scott was later on because he played for Hellbound. Oh, 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 Scott. Scott okay, and Matt. Okay, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah. uh, with originally, I was 
going to hang out at State uh, at, at All Is One practice because it was Music Unlimited and I used to live five and, minutes right, away. Right. I was hanging out at that studio all the time anyway. And then I started helping you guys kind of write songs a bit. Mm -hmm. And then Tony flaked out. And then you were like, Yo, dude, we you're here all the time. Right you now. should just play. And I was already helping you guys write songs. And then you asked me to play on the demo. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up producing the demo because when we were in the studio, all of a sudden everything was all a mess. And I'm right, like, because hey, that kid didn't know what do he this, was doing. You remember? do this, you do this. Mm -hmm. Because somebody had to take charge of it. And then Fi does get Fi does guest vocals on one of those really, songs. Yeah. And right. I'm that jerk that I'll be like, okay, I'll take over. And then Chris puts yeah. out the all is one video of us recording that demo. Remember there's like portions of it live? There's portions of it you you've I, never seen it? I, I don't think I've ever Oh seen I gotta it. send it to you. Uh, yeah, you're uh, in it. No, I don't remember that at all. Yeah, he's he's uh, in but there. But then I ended yeah. up like I'll send it to you. The original idea was that I was going to kind of manage the band, mm -hmm. and then... Play and manage, until they, we found some. Well, then Tony flaked out, and I was playing mm -hmm. bass tracks, and then I started playing the shows. Right. And which, then, uh, him managing helped out a lot, too, later, as which never really came to fruition, because as he's starting to do that, um, the band is starting to, like say like they want to start doing other things or like they didn't want to play anymore like it was get it was starting to get weird well, um I'll give you my perspective on it yeah everything well, I'm started, trying to be nice about it well every everything started to get flaky because Scott was in the mix but like when Scott came to try out mm -hmm. everybody flaked out so I played guitar for Scott's tryout you That's remember right. that mm -hmm. So I was like, well, I'm here. Might as well. I and know I, the had, songs. I yeah. had the room down the hall, I think. That's right. I forgot that day. So I was like, well, my guitar is right there. I'll go and, and like, if we're going to try the dude out, I guess I'll play the songs. Because mm -hmm. I knew the songs because I had helped you write some of the songs. Right. And so things were already starting to get flaky there. And then... The big Scott, blow. The big Scott joined. Right, but the biggest blow up or loss for us was we were put on that Memorial Day Scarhead Barbecue show mm -hmm. by cousin Joe, and all of a sudden Chris had personal plans and couldn't do it anymore. Right. He was going to a barbecue, and we were all I remember we were all annoyed because we were like, dude, we're playing with Scarhead. Like, are you like at a barbecue? I cousin don't Joe's if I putting was still together. Even in the picture, of that. you were you were playing yeah. bass. You were still a bass player. I was still. I don't even remember that. You were playing bass on it, but this is where it blows up. Scott, so remember, I Scott called, started. Playing no, I'll tell you what happens. I remember right. I was in my classroom. I came out of the classroom because he sent me the he sent me a text saying he wasn't playing. I was annoyed. I went out into the hallway. I called you and said, "Dude, I've had enough." And then that's when you said, "You know what? I'm not managing you guys anymore because if he's going to keep doing this thing, I'm done." Well, he didn't want me to manage you guys anyway. Well, because he didn't want so you to hold him accountable to the seriousness. Right. So everything that was going was happening. nuclear anyway. Yeah. Because the band was, like, I think what happened was, as that band became popular, and Muttley was helping us with the business end of it, I think Chris had, didn't really want to have anything to do with it being a business uh, end of it. And I don't think Jimmy did either, although he's an examine now and he's doing, My, doing great. I think just timing for everybody then was like, ah, Mike's going to end up quitting anyway because he's in principal school. Um... Chris was getting into the real estate stuff and starting to make money, uh -huh. my, and my Jimmy impression. was Jimmy was Jimmy was working with Maury, right? And he was starting to get busy. He was getting very busy, and I think that people just were like, "Well, we already have stuff that's my impression keeps us busy." You know, my impression was that Chris didn't like being controlled. Somebody else, yeah, no, kind of drive. No, well, that's so it. So the, con the control he, end of it. Like, yeah, he wanted, mm -hmm. like, he thought he knew better, so he wanted to do it. Well, he himself. just wanted to have fun. It was all about having fun but for him, which I which I appreciated. It was just different goals, like. But at that me, time, I, I think we helped you guys yeah. do more stuff, and he just yeah, because at that time we were ready for it. Like, it, like we had already played. I remember we had already played. We had already played with Have Heart Verse. And these bands were popular at that time. Well, you booked some of those shows, right? uh, Yeah, the ones yeah. at Europa. So right. we played with Have Heart, um, Verse, and I gave Incendiary, yes, Incendiary, I gave them their first show in New York City. They played that wow. show um, because they were made, They were just great, and it was off their, I think it was whatever they had on online. Um, 
the first record. And then Rival Mob played because they were there with Have Heart. And so Rival Mob got on. So we were playing shows where like there were a good number of people watching us. Yeah. We we actually mid headline the Have Heart first show because I booked it so we could play whatever position we wanted. <laughs> right. So Rival Mob was just starting to get hot. Incendiary was just known. So I think Incendiary opened. Rival Mob played next. We threw some middle band in there. And then I think this is where it really died and ended. We played that show and they acted like, it, I remember, idiot on stage. Like really like not like a professional hardcore band. Not that there's one, but like there's a persona you put on stage. Um, and it was like, dude, we're nobody. Like we're just a bunch of, you know, guys yeah. from the Bronx and Queens. In Long Island, that play hardcore. Yeah. yeah, great. We we have some cool connections with bands now because we played out and we know Hammer Bros and we know like we made friends with a bunch of people. But like that didn't make us better than anybody. So I think that that's what started happening too. I think that Chris thought we were doing it on our own and didn't need a manager to do it. But what he didn't know was I didn't want to do it anymore. I was busy. Like I was in in. Columbia Teachers College in a preparatory program. All I had enough time for was my kid, my wife, doing my homework, band practice, and playing the shows. I was perfectly like grateful that Muttley was going to take it over because he knew where the band business-wise could have gone at that next level. And then I think that was it. That was it. Chris was done. It was done. But that band had like the potential to still be like a hardcore band people would be talking about and paying attention to right now if we all just would have stood focused on staying serious about it yeah. for a minute. Yeah. So we all have those, blame. Those bands that you all mentioned on some of those shows were were kind of big bands, but they were still on the come up. Like yeah. they, were, they were growing and getting even bigger. Yeah, my favorite my favorite show was we played with the first step. <laughs> we played with the first step the effort, all straight edge bands. And that was the great thing about this band. We could play with straight edge bands. We could play with non straight edge bands because as much as I was straight edge and, and people knew that was my thing. Um, they also knew the band was about just having a good time, like, and playing yeah, good shows and we could fit in, um, to all those, all those places. Um, cause we played with plenty of bands that were not, no, so no, we played, I remember we played that, um, we played that place in New Jersey that was like was it was an underground say, what, what, cave oh, kind of thing. Is, is was that the meat the I don't know what it was called, but we played with. We played a different place that was like the Spanish bar. Wait, that's the story. The yeah. So yeah. that's the Mexican. That's the Mexican restaurant with the pool hall. Yes. So we played. That was, what was the show. The name of that place? Do you remember? No clue. Because I was just thinking about that. But Richter came, recorded it. Yeah. So he's so and, and so it's funny. Do you remember who else played that show? There was another band on there that show that ended up being kind of big. And yeah. I'm thinking I, it was Ceremony, but it wasn't. Oh uh, no! It, it was my so mindset. It was mindset. 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 Okay. okay. One of my favorite yeah. bands. It was. The second mindset. Mindset. Not the which mindset that became Sworn Enemy. Got it. Yeah, it was the uh, the straight edge mindset from the New Englandish area. I don't know where they're from. Baltimore. Yeah, I think they're from Baltimore. Either way, I have the blue. Hood. I love them. They're they're there was straight another, edge band. I, there was another band that played that show that had like the AFI kind of like almost goth vibe. Huh. I can't and remember, I can't who, remember it who it was. It's been driving me crazy. I need to ask. So it was about. what? So that show was great because um, one, as much as it wasn't about like the business end of it, these knuckleheads are at the bar putting down the Modelos and the tacos because they were still feeding. <laughs> And um, what we do. This is what they did. Um, we get up to go play, and the place, it's a small pool hall, but like it's that hardcore feel that come, like, you know, 100 people in a room ready to play. You know, it was all straight edge bands mostly, and, and us. A lot of younger kids. Younger kids, like, you know, the influence that you want to have on, uh, and we turn, and I'm like, let's open with Burning Fight. And I remember you look at me like, and you're like, I don't care as long as you get me another beer or whatever. <laughs> I'll play whatever the hell song you want, Mike. And I was like, dude, just trust me. Burning Fight. That's the song. And so I turned to Chris and Chris is like, yeah, okay, got it. You look okay, got it. I, and that, that was the best part of like, I'm, I'm just filling in. Like, I don't care. Oh, whatever. Okay, you, you, Mike, you're me. in charge. So like, I handled the business. We opened with here. those two chords, right? And we played so the pool tables were here. There are two pool tables here. 
And so the band is here. We don't know. So we bum 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 bum. Yo, when I tell you a hundred kids from the pool tables flying over us, all over, like you said, like that was the day I said, like this is why I wanted to be in a hardcore punk band because this is fun. Like, and it was like there was nothing to do with merch sales and getting. I don't think we got paid aside from what they ate. Um, at that show, <laughs> and drank. like and drank, like, but it was like you said to yourself, "This is what like playing hardcore punk rocks about," and that's what we had got into it for. And the best part, by the way, is that since you have a straight edge guy in the band, I'll take his share. <laughs> <laughs> they took my drink tickets often, but um, so then like so 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 um, back to like my roots in the Bronx end of heavy music, so. Let's go back to like, okay, um, I'm getting back into hardcore. I remember the only way you used to still be able to get tapes from people was writing letters. Uh So I wrote to Mike from District 9 because I had seen them play at a Castle Heights show or somewhere, but couldn't get my hands on Music. music. So I write to him and he sends me the the seven inch in the mail and a letter i wish i still had the letter because it was like the nicest letter like a, someone could write like oh dude from the bronx yo you gotta come check us out and in that letter it was we're playing a skate park near uh-huh. yankee stadium <laughs> we're sick of it all you need to come to that oh. show and we're gonna we're gonna set it off um you and know and everything I'm, is connected and i'm like Oh man, like, cool. I'm gonna go to, like, I'm gonna go to this show. This is gonna be a good time. I didn't even know about it. Um, and at the time, I'm just finishing my degree at Hunter. Um, and I have this, I have the seven inch, and on the back of it, there's a picture of the band. Um, so I'm looking, and there's a guy standing out at Hunter College. He's standing out. I'm going, that's the drummer from District 9. That's the drummer from District 9. That's the drummer from District 9. So I go, you know, I'm going to go up to him and I'm going to talk to him. So I go up to him and go, hey, you know, I don't mean to bother you, but you're the guy that drums for District 9, right? And he goes, yeah, Ray, pleasure to meet you. I'm like, dude, I love your band. Like, you guys are awesome. So he's like, oh, cool. And like, whenever we'd have class, um, because I went to school at night, um, we'd see each other and we'd chill and we'd hang and we'd talk. Um, And so, you know, anytime... Um. Um. They played. He had he. I would go see them, but then he leaves the band, and he's like, "Hey, I'm drumming for a new band, Fahrenheit Four Five One." So Sue, so I already knew from the demo, and I'm like, "Wait a second, you drum for both bands?" And he's like, "Yeah, well, I'm on the outs with District Nine at this point. I guess kind of I'm playing that." show and then I'm like done which By I think the way, is the history right after that time right? was when, the short time when I played for District 9, 9. the first time yeah so then um, so I'm like oh cool he's like hey man like we're we're gonna play this uh, show called Alive and Well in New Jersey uh, do you wanna go and I'm like do I wanna go I'm like that's one of the biggest shows being like advertised for hardcore like you know Free Your Five was playing Sick of It All was playing Eight Two All was playing Matt like everybody was playing that show, I'm like, wait a second, like, I can just go with you, like, and hang out with you? And he was like, yeah, man, like, it's cool, like, we're, we're gonna have a good time. Um, and this is, like, right before Grave Disorder. So, um, I drive down with him, he drives with a bunch of friends, uh, and they're late, we're in traffic. So, Fahrenheit's supposed to play. And so, he's getting out of the car while it's moving, <laughs> and he's like, yo, man, blah, blah. I'm like, how the hell am I supposed to get in the show? Like, you're my <laughs> ticket into the damn thing! And so he get he like he's getting out to and he's got to go to the bathroom or something. So um, I jump out while the car's moving because I know now I'm not. They, his friends had tickets. I didn't have tickets. I'm like I'm not getting in the show. So like now I jump out of the vehicle while it's moving, and um, he plays and I get to hang out backstage at that show, um, and that's how I first met Lenny. Um, and we were never in bands together, but all of our bands end up playing with each other. So uh, when he starts Dominican Day Parade. Um, they're playing with State of Disgrace on like a ton of shows. Right. Uh-huh. Like we're playing with them, like, and we're not booking each other, but it just so happens DDP and circles. State of Disgrace yeah. 
are playing. We're caught in a trap, like in a like we're all just like playing shows, two thousand four, two thousand five, and like you're thinking hardcore is dead. But I'll give those bands credit. We were trying to help keep that thing going as much as the bigger bands were, because we were saying little bands play shows too, and we were getting some pretty good, you know, houses and and people showing up to to shows, and it was a, it was a good it was a good time. So I can't say that all of I think all is one did piggyback off of some of the state of disgrace, minor popularity. Yeah. But I think we were able to just build something else that just made it escalate. But um, so now I'm finding like, all right, Fahrenheit's from the Bronx and, you know, District 9's from the Bronx and Billy Club's from the Bronx. Like the Bronx has hardcore bands. Um, you know, um, so i um, trying to think of what happens then. So then, okay, the other bands. So all is one. Uh, ends, and um, Richie calls me and says, hey, I think I want to start doing State of Disgrace again. And I'm like, you're kidding me. <laughs> um, and he's like, nah, dude, like, what do you think? We could play a couple of shows. Like, no new music, no recording. Um, just jamming, playing uh, some shows. Um, do you know a drummer? And I knew my friend Ian. I can't remember what band he was drumming for, but he was drumming for a straight edge band. And I said, hey, dude, do you want to play for State of Disgrace? And he was like, wait, for your band, State of Disgrace? And I'm like, yeah, it's not that big a deal. Um, but he knew the band, so he was like, yeah, man, it'd be a pleasure. Um, and little did I know that um, I'm at a show, and there's um, somebody's like, hey, the guy from Token Entry is looking for a band, Johnny. He's looking to play hardcore again. You should look him up. And... Um, I forget how we find him, but we it's either through a text message or an email. So someone gives us his information. Oh, Ernie, the drummer from Token Entry, knows Richie. Oh, yeah. He passes it, I think, to Richie and says, well, the worst that happens is he says no. He says yes. And then we get the other guy from the heavy band from Long Island to play second guitar. And we're in this, like, state of disgrace 2.0. We play out a couple of times. And then that's where Richie, one day, the second guitar player is in the room. I always forget his name, and I apologize, but he was mad cool, and he played guitar really well. Um, he's in the room. Ian is there, and Johnny's there. and Because Johnny ends up in one of my other bands that dies. Um, and Richie says, I'm done. I can't play this next show. I can't travel with you guys. I quit. Like, not quit, but like I just can't do it. And then the four of us decide, okay, Richie can't play. What are we going to do? Because we said we were going to play the show. What was that? He just had other stuff going on? Or he was just sick really, of it? Or? The, I think, for me, I think his kids were getting older. Right. His wife, I think, might have been even saying to him, like, hey, you're traveling, like, all the time to Queens from out of where they lived on Long Island for practices. Yeah, yeah. I think it was starting to get taxing on his family life. Be, yeah. And I think he thought he could start doing it again in the band, like, and play yeah, in a full-time band again. I but he really he couldn't. And then I think that's the show. The show that we play is in. Um, it's like one of those like pay to play twenty one. I don't even know why we played it. We probably shouldn't even played it. Some club in Brooklyn, um, and like nobody showed up. And that's when I realized, like, you know, nostalgia for State of Disgrace is great, but it's not State of Disgrace anymore. Yeah. If it's just me and right. a bunch of like filling guys, like, and nobody really cares about the band anymore. Um, you know, I'm just done. Like, I'm just, I think I'm done playing in bands. What year was that? I'm going to say 2010. Okay. 9, 10. I see. Um, let's let's take it back a, a little bit, and I'm curious to learn how you first um, decided to become straight edge. Oh, man. Uh, you, it's That's easy. Youth of today. Okay. So, right. um, <laughs> but side by side, too, and I'll tell a funny story. So, during the CB days, we're going down all the time, and side by side is we're listening. By the way, do you remember your first hardcore show? Yeah. What was it? Um, it was Agnostic Front for sure. Okay. I just can't remember who the other bands were, so it was Agnostic Front. Damn it. CBs. Yeah, it was CBs. But not the last. It wasn't not A7. Their last show. No, no, this was the one of their first. Like, okay. like this so is this the is band hasn't even put out calls for alarm yet. Oh wait, that ba that far? Yeah, back? dude, I'm going to shows eighty five, eighty six. Okay, uh -huh. like that's the a. Uh -huh. But who played? 
I know AF was the first because I remember, like, I was addicted to that rap. I was addicted to victim in pain, like, yeah. to a degree that, like, like they were to me. They were what I wanted to be. Like, I wanted to. Yeah, cause for cause for alarm was eighty six. Yeah, I wanted to be, uh, you know, a punk rock hardcore rebel. Like, yeah. they just spoke to me. In a way that I don't think like metal was at the time, sure, sure. because I was starting to say like, how much could I hail Satan and like, you know, like, <laughs> like right. worship the devil, you know, like or piss my mother off, you yeah. know, with Slayer posters in my room. Yeah, sure. Um, like sure. they just spoke to me in a way. I'm, I'm gonna. I wish I knew exactly, but I know it was CBs. I know it was around '85. It was before Cause for Alarm for sure, because I saw Warzone. Warzone was my favorite band too. Uh-huh. Like a ton of times. Like when "Don't Forget the Struggle," uh, "Don't Forget the Streets" was released, I was at that record release show. Um, you know, um, so we're going to the shows, um, and side by sides playing their first show. But I was listening to the radio show um, "Crucial Chaos." Yeah, but sure. I, before it was Crucial Chaos, or it was, still was like it was, it was Crucial Chaos. Right? Yeah, so yeah. I'm listening Johnny to Johnny Stiff was doing it. Back yeah, then. I'm listening to that and recording it on my tape recorder. All the bands when they would play. I see. I so see. side by side played put on that on that Crucial Chaos show, and I recorded their them playing, and that was in my Walkman uh-huh. every day. So when they played, I believe it was with Youth of Today. Or Gorilla Biscuits. They opened. They were the first band. And there weren't a lot of people. But when they played Friends, I got up on stage and took the mic and I sang all the words, you know, and then I gave the mic back and he was like, I think he knows the words better than I do. (laughs) And it was like the moment that it was like, I think that's probably when I thought maybe I should front it. And I didn't, don't think I'm a talented vocalist at all, but like, I think that was like my thing where it was like, this is comfortable and cool. I want to do this. Yeah. But like, at that moment, I was like, you know what? I like I gravitate to this. Like, I didn't really drink or do like my buddies were doing drugs and drinking. It just wasn't my thing. Yeah, sure. So I don't think like I put label to it too much back then. Um, and then just decided like that was it. That was that was the the thing. Because even in state of disgrace, there wasn't like a pronouncement of me being straight a, a lot. People sure. didn't know or know or care. Like it was much more during the, during the all is one days. Because I remember Richie was like, eh, you know, toward the tail end, like, and I, for good reason. We're not a straight edge band. You can't write straight edge lyrics. Like, it, it's not cool, you know, to write straight edge lyrics for a non-straight edge band. And it really, like, all of one wasn't so much about the straight edge lyrics as much as it was they let me, like, allude to things about it. was about it. positive. Right. So, like, I sure. could I could weave that in. And Richie liked positive stuff. But he also wanted us to be that band that was politically saying to people, like, we're in a state of disgrace. Like, he took the theme of that band seriously, and he should have. But I think while toward that tail end of it, I wasn't, wasn't, that wasn't my vibe anymore. Yeah, sure. Um, so it's I'm not like, always easy to be political. You know, so I think, and I also think people started to shy away from us because I think that's, we... That's why it's not You know, easy. which why it was like, it was fun to write songs like It'll Never Go Away because it was like... And Richie loved that song to a degree, but he also was like, ah, I'd rather play this song live than that song because this song's what the band's about. And I, I, underst- I understood it, but I don't think toward the tail end I was, I was I like guys were different, ultimately different like excited about it all the time. You sure, know what I mean? Sure. And I wasn't into politics, so it was it was a tough it was a I tough see. sale. He's very he right he's into politics. Oh lot, yeah, so, we've talked about it. Man. Yeah, so it was like hard for me to to do that. So then uh, I start Kill the Clock, which never really did anything. But we played a couple of cool shows because I still was, I wasn't, wouldn't say friends with, but I was still connected to some of the guys in those <clears throat> other bands. So, like, we played a show with Mindset when they played Brooklyn. We opened, we played three songs, uh, you know, because I was friendly with them. Like, I gave them shows in New York. Yeah. So, but at that time, it was like, now I'm driving. I had never driven before. But now I'm in a band by myself. I have no Danny. Ian lives in Brooklyn. Um, I was starting to work in Tarrytown. Uh-huh. So I needed to learn how to drive to get to work because I could not do the 3.30 in the morning train anymore because oh <laughs> I had to get to work. By se- my kids arrived at 7.30. So I was like, I can't be in a band and do th- I got to drive. So when Kill the Clock started, actually toward the tail end of All is One, and when I started this Kill the Clock band, I was driving to shows and right. hauling equipment 
And I started to realize like, wow, the burden I put on other people to mm-hmm. drive me around all the time. Like I kind of appreciated that they did that for me because they shouldn't have, you know, Richie lived in Queens. He would, dr- if Danny was too drunk to drive, he'd drive me home to the Bronx. So yeah. like, and then drive himself to Queens at like three in the morning. So like, I'm grateful to like the guys who did uh, do that for me, but then kill the clock was the end for me. I kind of was like, I don't have any. I, just, I don't have anything to say anymore. Like we were writing like really cool thrash songs. I just remember. But I just didn't have anything to say. What was it? About to break. Holy moly! How did I? <laughs> that was four. We forgot about to break. So I was going to say, where does break. that fit in? Yeah, here? where does that oh fit in? Oh my god! <clears throat> and that's had, and I, Richie's in that band. So wait a minute. So so I got. <laughs> so my wife's going to kill me. Grave disorder. Going. So we've got. I had those songs on my phone, but I don't have them now. Oh, so I got I'll, a new phone. I don't have. I'll send it to you. So no, I have them at home. So I just didn't uh, put them on. So my phone. wait, so wait, so it's. So where it's that actually place? before all is one. Oh really? Oh okay, really? Okay. It was that far back. It's so. actually before all is one, and Richie started it by sending again the same way he did "Stay the Disgrace," and this is where he was okay with the straight edge stuff because about to break. If you listen has some straight edge vibes to some of the songs. I think he was like, okay, we're not doing State of Disgrace anymore. Um, I thought it was later in the show. No, no, no. He sends me the songs. They're not State of Disgrace songs. So I'm like, all right, let's let's see what we can do. He gets um, John to play bass. I knew the drummer from Awkward Thought. Um, Brian, oh, yeah. I think is his name. Yes. I got him to drum because Danny quit. Yeah. Danny was going to yeah. start. That's when we stopped talking to Danny. Danny said, I don't want to do it. Richie played guitar. Danny was doing John played bass. And who was the second guitar player? There was there was a second guitar player. Okay. And that band short-lived. But that demo to me was some of the best music uh-huh. that we put out. Uh-huh. It was so just catchy, good John wrote a couple of great songs. Richie wrote some great songs. And then that, that's when Richie Richie then says, I can't play in a band anymore either. And about to break, is about to end. So I post to try to find new people for a straight edge band because I really wanted to start a straight edge band. Right. And the guys, that was it. The bass player, John played guitar. The bass right. player, John, and the drummer, and they can assume what they want. Assumed I was going to kick them all out and make about to break a straight edge band with Richie. But Richie was leaving. And then I was like, okay, maybe I don't want to do this without Richie anymore. I was just going to start a side project, Uh all straight edge. They thought I was doing a coup and starting a band and kicking them all out. out. And they ended up kicking me out of my own band. (laughs) They kicked me out of, of about to break. And that, here's where the interesting thing is, they get a new singer who's the singer for Examine. Oh, He's wow. now the singer oh, no for kidding. About to Break, and that's how him and John know each other. Oh, oh wow. Okay, okay, okay. So all is one. Also, when me and Muttley left, thought they were going to keep going without us. And that guy came in and stepped in as the singer right. for yeah. all is one. They played a couple of shows. It wasn't the same because it wasn't, the same shows, um, and then that's when Jimmy and that guy start examine. So technically, bands come like good bands start to kind of come out of right. even the, the ending of of other bands. So then, right then, it's all is one. Then it's kill the clock. Then I stop playing music at all. I haven't been in a band. Since 2012. Okay. And where does State of Disgrace 2.0 fall into? Uh, somewhere after All About to Break and All is One. Like, okay. it's it's like somewhere either, it's either after the All is One ending or right after the About to Break ending. Oh, okay, okay. Because then Richie was like, wait, I just didn't want to play in About to Break anymore because we were having trouble. There was like internal things going on um, where Richie wanted to write more like... And this is no slight to John or Richie. Richie wanted to write more posy kind of songs. John wanted to write more like street punk anthem songs. Uh-huh. And it didn't mesh with how the band was trying right, to go. Yeah, everybody wanted to go in different directions. And Richie, as much as he's the nicest guy you'll ever meet, he isn't good with confrontation. So he never wanted to tell John 
that the songs he was writing weren't what he wanted to write for the band. Yeah. So that was left to me, which it, I think also added to that dissonance that ends up happening before the alleged, you know, we'll call it the alleged coup to get to get rid of everybody. And then, um, and then, um, that was, and then that was like kind of it. Then the, we, me and Richie said, oh, let's try to say this crazy thing for a little while. Then Richie disappears. And then all is one comes back. So like all these people kind of come back into my story uh, differently, but all for great reasons, I think, you know, and I appreciate, like, I, I, and I hope if they watch it, I, like, I'm not sliding anybody. And if I got something wrong, uh, you know, I hope they, uh, you know, they can correct me because I think, you know, they were pivotal to the idea that I could even be in a band in my late 20s, early 30s, even almost 40, um, you know, and I, I kind of appreciated the idea of these people being around me and helping carve out who I, I don't have a big history in, in, in Bronx music, but like the idea that I have a band that I can say people might know or might listen to or oh, have the really CDs, yeah. you know, like, and that I had a great time with people, I think is what I'm like most proud of, like being able to share here, you know, like I'm not like, I'm not somebody important, but, um, I feel like we made important music that hopefully some people really, um, enjoyed and listened to and like I got to be friends with somebody I'm still close with or in contact with when I was close as we used to be but I can text him and he's going to answer me back he's going to we're going to chat it up you know we got to get together a little more often but you know that's my history but so I'm just a 54 year old guy from the Bronx who likes heavy music turned into a hardcore kid still a hardcore kid today um and that's it so just a, a couple more questions sure. from the early period, um, because, you know, like we've talked about, the, the few years make a difference as far as the bands you were familiar with and, and all of that. Um, I know on the phone you said you knew, you knew the drummer in Maximum Penalty. Oh, yeah. that's a great story. That's right. You mentioned it. So, so in that band Schizoid, the drummer of that band is Mark Labetti. He is then ends up the drummer for Maximum Penalty. So he went to Columbus then, huh? He was in Columbus High School. Uh -huh. He played in oh, wow. he played drums in that schizoid band. Did that band have a bass player named Lewis? Probably. I can't remember all the guys' names. Danny and Mark I was close with. There was a redheaded kid who played bass. Don't remember his name. Nice guy. But he was like their bass player. Yeah, might be a guy that I went to grade school. I wouldn't be surprised. So skinny kid. Thin as a rail? No. Yeah, so 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 he plays in schizoid. So it's funny because he, um, he's now about 19, right? 89, 88, 89. Um, and he's like, all right, the schizoid thing ended for him. He's like, yo man, I just joined this new band. You guys got to check it out. It's dope. It's called maximum penalty. And I'm like, Oh cool. Like awesome. Like I want to check it out. And he plays a couple of songs for us, whatever. And I'm like, yo, this band is really good. So I remember I saw him play with them, I think, once, maybe first show. And I think that was where, like, I was like, okay, they're great. But the scene itself was starting to get, feel like a little right. bit odd. Um, so I'm like, all right, you know, I think I'm, I'm like, I'm done, like, a little bit. I remember when I started getting back into it, I find Maximum Penalty and I write a letter to a guy named Mark and say, hey, you know, like the band... Because then, like, in my mind, I don't remember the connection. I'm like, uh, you know, here's money for the 7-inch and a T-shirt. Nothing ever shows up. And I'm like, damn, man, like, this is messed up. Like, what's going on? Like, I, I, I paid Send for this merch. through the mail, the old days. The old days. Uh -huh. <laughs> sure enough, the singer sends me a letter with... With the CD, because now they release, I think they released the Lower East Side, not the, the, East the Side Stories, East Side Stories Story. uh -huh. and says, hey man, I, I rummaged through some stuff, just so you know, our drummer was a criminal, was taking money from us, uh, his name was Mark, Mark, you wrote to him, I'm sending you this because I found this, and you never got, you. he took your money, but I saw your letter, you didn't get the merch, <laughs> something like that, and I end up with, I end up with that either that record or the or the or the um 
or the original demo on a on a vinyl. Oh, I can't wow. remember what it is, but he sends me something, and that's when I'm like, Mark Labetti, Mark Labetti, Mark Labetti. I'm like, holy moly, I went to school with that guy. He's the guy who like. Stole all the maximum penalties oh. money. Which, by the way, they're like one of my favorite bands as well. So it's like funny how like everything's so connected in like this scene. Like even the Brian Darwas guy, two four five. Like he ends up in Roger Merritt and the Disasters. Uh -huh, uh -huh. The drummer from two four five ends up in Stigma and Wisdom in Chains. Right. Not that I hooked them up in any way because they're two talented human beings. But the idea that it was like well. Brian Darwars met Roger because we played a show where he met right. Stigma and started talking and to him. All, and, and it's all connected. Oh, and he does hot rods. And oh, Roger's got. And like, mm -hmm. connect, oh, and then he hooks them up with uh, Luke. And now Luke drums for Wisdom. Right. But like, the idea that just from being in a band that overtakes the Mannheim Club on a Saturday, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> these people now are in like bands. Like, you then say, wait a minute. Like, it's awesome. I know all these great people in great bands. Muttley too. You know, like it's kind of cool to know that you've like know these people and that there's a history there, or you know, thin threads of of connection to people. And I think that's what's important about music. It connects us in such great ways that you sometimes just forget about it. That's right. But I got to start right. going. I'm sorry. I told my wife to take her to dinner. Oh, you know, no, that's <laughs> fine. Uh, one more, one more, one more. Real quick ahead, question, yeah. uh, just to make sure that um, I, I, you might be one of the only people so far to talk about this, but there's a, a, a bar that you mentioned uh, off camera on, on East Tremont where you remember. The Wicked Wolf or Grey Wolf, one of the two. It had both names. And there used to be metal shows there? Metal and Thrax. Yes. I believe I saw Anthrax there before they were even Anthrax or while Anthrax was coming together because a lot of like up-and-coming metal bands would play that, would play that place. Uh-huh. You know, so I could swear, because I remember what Scott Ian looks like, obviously, um, <laughs> um, that... Um, we'll, we'll just tape something the, on. I used to have it, remember? <laughs> and, um, um, like, that place was cool, because even bands like Hellhound played there, and The Unjust, like, they, all these bands played there. You know, and you don't realize and that was way that was way down Tremont. way down Tremont, but All like these local local Bronx local bands, right? Bronx bands played there, you know, and it's like and, and I wish Anthrax I was a local Bronx band, Bronx band, band there, right? So. so like, and you think to yourself, like, wait a second, did I just see like the Anthrax that's like now on MTV? Right. You know, yeah. like um, like way back when I was a kid. So. Um, you know, a lot of fun. I mean, I, can't, I wish I remembered all the shows are there because they would get some decent bands. I don't remember if I saw them like do a sneak show of SOD there, huh. but I've seen SOD a ton of times at CB's. Um, I was at, you know, all the Rich shows, Leeway's first show, Cro Mags, Leeway, Bad Brains. Like, I was at all those shows. You know, you wish you had better memories of them. Like, and in those moments, you're enjoying them, but it's like, um, you know, that's how much you're like, I'm into music. So I was sick of it all open for Slayer and get booed and got beat up because we were beating up kids who didn't like sick of it all <laughs> that night, you know, like with Biohazard, like all the I stuff. That, that show. Man, you know, like all the like good times because, you know, I'm sticking up for sick of it all, which that's another small connection that's odd with life. Um, when I worked in Sleepy Hollow, Tarrytown, I was the assistant principal of the middle school. Oh, and no, um, Armand lives in Sleepy Hollow, Tarrytown. His son was in the middle school when I was the middle school assistant principal. And um, so I saw him one day. I'm um, driving down the hill to go get coffee to Dunkin' Donuts, and there's the, there's Armand walking his dog on, and sleepy, and I, like, pulled to the side. I'm like, Armand, your band's the band. Like, dude, sick of it all. And he, like, calls me over, walks over, and he's like, hey, you like my band? Like, we start talking. I'm like, yeah, you know, you're great, blah, blah, blah. You know, and then I show him my sick of it all um, tattoo. And he's like, nice, man. I'm like, dude, pleasure to meet you. Like, you know, but like, that's how like small connections like life is like, Great. That's you know, a crazy meeting on parent teacher day. <laughs> yeah. But like funny, because I remember like, like he, the only reason I knew the kid was his son and sorry, Armand, his son was in trouble and he had to come to school <laughs> with his wife because his son was in trouble for something. And he's sitting there and I'm going. They're looking at the last name, looking at him, looking at the last name, looking at him. Awkward. And I go, you're the drummer from Sick of It. And he probably doesn't remember this happening to him, but you're the drummer from Sick of It All. He's like, dude, yeah. And the principal, who wasn't a nice lady, goes, 
You know him? You know him? You can't be in this meeting now because you know him. So then I'm like, I'm the assistant principal. How am I not in the meeting? And I wasn't allowed to be in the disciplinary meeting for his son because wow. she thought I was, even though I wasn't friendly with him, I knew who he was. Right. So, wow. small world. Funny. Small world. Yeah, life. <laughs> All good stories, right? Well, thank you so much. Yep. Uh, no, my pleasure. But, uh, you know, and to all the guys, like I said, that played in bands with me, I uh, appreciate you 100% because it's some of the best times of, of my life. Uh, but music, you know, and just being a part of anything in New York and the Bronx uh, was a lot of fun. Bronx Underground was some of the best times uh, we I had in a band playing shows because kids were just into music. They didn't care if you were punk rock or hardcore or metal, like kids moshed and sang along in, at your shows. Uh, there and I think that whoever you know those people that put that together like should be given some kudos because they kept like that underground music in the Bronx uh, moving and you know allowed uh, bands like mine to have a platform you know we never became popular but you know we had a good time and so to me I'm just grateful for the times I had.